Well, it's great to be back out here again and uh, with another very exciting guest, Joanne Wilson. We've just uh, heard a brief introduction. Joanne's had a background in uh, retail, uh, in media, in tech, and has become a, a lead investor. So very exciting to talk about uh, the title of today's topic, which is how times have changed investing in web 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, but also a chance to, to get some nuggets on investing and uh, how best to raise funds from someone like Joanne. So Joanne, welcome. Great to be here with you. Let's start with just a, an overview. You've got a portfolio of what, just under 100 investments now. Yeah. Uh, is there a kind of common theme that you look for through those? Because they're in all sorts of different sectors. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm investing in people. Um, so, and, you know, I'm lucky enough that I can invest in things that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So, it is people that I'm in, I, I like what they're doing, they're scrappy, they're tenacious, I believe that they'll be able to execute on their idea. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And 75% uh, of my investments are women not founders, so that's something I'm really, uh, I believe in. And, um, and I've also made a real conscious decision to invest in minorities as well, because I think, I believe that I should. Uh, and uh, you, you mentioned that 75% uh, of your investments are run by uh, women, they're founded by women and the minorities as well. But I, I've read a quote from you. You've said it's a decision that's more practical than philanthropic. So there's business reasons behind it as well. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm not in this to give away money. But but <laughs> but in particular, you 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 think that women founders can often be better than the male founders. Is that right? I think women founders are fantastic, and they look at things differently than men. Um, they tend to be slow and steady wins the race. Uh, it takes them longer to sort of amp up their businesses. Um, but in the end, I, mean, I really believe that all of these businesses should, should be gender balanced. I mean, I love having a female founder, but I certainly don't want to be in a company where there's only females, mm -hmm. just like I would never want to be in a company where there's only men. So if I came to you with an idea, you would consider it at least? Yes. You know, <laughs> I have invested in men. They just have to be so much better. Okay. Well, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. It's good to have a, a tough hurdle to get over. Let, let's go to the question, uh, the title of our, our topic. So how times have changed investing in web 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0? What is, that, in fact, the main difference between the transition from, from 1 to 2 to 3? It's the level of interaction, is it, between all parties involved? Well, you know... Web 1.0 was really people that saw the internet as this new frontier. And everyone just sort of jumped on, many people jumped on this bandwagon with the thought that, I mean, everything's going to switch to the internet. You know, we're never going to have brick and mortar. And everything's going to be built on these, this technology platform, particularly in the consumer space. But it, it, a lot of these businesses died and they were overvalued. And it was more about a wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think when the, the next generation of the web came into play, you know, which is really around 2006, seven, it started percolating, is that most of the entrepreneurs that were starting businesses had not come out of the last generation, but they also grew up with um, computers. And so it was more about how do you integrate this technology into their businesses? So they, they, they had a better understanding of the businesses because they understood what you could do with this technology. Mm -hmm. I thought that most of the businesses that came out of that generation that we're still in um, were a hell of a lot more interesting than the ones that were in the first generation. Sure. Uh, now, a big theme, of, of course, uh, as the internet has developed has been disruption. Uh, how new entrepreneurs can, can drastically alter the landscape of existing businesses. Are there any sectors out there that you're looking at or subsectors where there hasn't been that disruption yet, where there's still huge on, entrepreneurial uh, opportunity, we might say? I, I think there's always entrepreneurial opportunity. I mean, there's businesses that, you know, filled voids 25 or 20 years ago you know, with the first generation of the web, and it's time. It's time for, an, you know, the new generation. Mm -hmm. um, and there's certainly areas in transportation, um, and technology is certainly amplifying um, uh, biotech. So, you know, we're looking at agriculture is going to change dramatically because of phones. So I think there's tons of things that are still out there that have yet to be changed due to technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, of course, you've got uh, almost 100 companies in your portfolio. I'm sure uh, that was 
having seen way more than 100, and there must be loads that you reject. <laughs> yes. So, so for, for people out there, entrepreneurs themselves, that, that might be looking for funding at some point in the future, what are the key do's and don'ts? When you see pitches to yourself, what draws you in and what do you look at and think, gosh, you know, I'm not touching that? You know, I like to see things that I look at and think, wow, like I haven't seen many of these versus like this building a better mousetrap of a company that's companies that have been around in a space that are well funded for a couple of years. By the way, it doesn't mean they can't be end up being the number one, mm -hmm. but it's probably not something that I would jump into um, unless I was insanely impressed by the founders that actually understood that arena. So mm -hmm. for instance, I've been in businesses where I've seen a lot of startups in a space, but nobody even came out of that space. And then you see someone come along that actually spent 10 or 20 years in that space that is trying to do something. And to me, it's like, okay, they actually understand that business. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Um, you know, and I want to see short decks that come into my box. I don't want someone to tell me what the exit is going to be before they even entered. Mm -hmm. I find that really annoying. Um, because if it's a good business, there will be something going down the mm -hmm. future. And ultimately, does it come down your decision on the founder, on management itself, is that the key factor behind a successful it's business? It's all about the founder. It's all about the founder. I mean, I'm, I, out of those, you know, almost 100 businesses, I probably gave 50% of them their first dollar. So not a lot to really do analysis on. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely all about the founder. Uh, so given that, when it can be such early stage, how do you weigh up the valuation of these, these types of, of, of businesses? Are there metrics that you look on, or, or is there an element that you would admit of just going with blind hope and belief in an in individual? I mean, it depends on what stage they are when they come in my door. I mean, and also if they've run a business or had an exit before. But I, mean, I do think that if you've built a business before and exited and you start another business, you actually deserve to have a little provenance and be at a higher valuation. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm a big believer in low valuations at the beginning because you've got a lot of milestones to hit to get to the next valuation if you want to have an up round. And um, if you find yourself in a position where you didn't hit those milestones, your company's actually not worth that much money, you're not going to get any money in the next round. Um, now, Joanne, we've heard lots about your successes and, and uh, people are well aware of that. Tell us about your failures. What's the worst investment you've ever made? Oh, I would never say that. Oh, you go know, on. Yeah, I mean, the truth is, is that the one, I had one colossal failure, um, and that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I learned more about people, business, um, winding something down, making decisions, paying more attention to red flags. Um, it, it was honestly, that entrepreneur did me a, a real solid. Only one? You've got 100 investments at the moment and you only have one that's underwater, as it were? Oh, that one died, and I've had, uh, I think, four others besides that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you, you mentioned transport as a sector that, that really interests you. What are the latest investments you've done in that sector? And, and tell us a bit about why they're such exciting opportunities. So I did a, uh, a deal in Los Angeles, a uh, young woman who started a business around shipping and boats. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially... You know, as we become a flatter world and we're importing and exporting. And what I liked about it is she owned an import ex business, a really very successful business. And she was insanely frustrated by, you know, the 19 copies that she had to sign and how nobody knew which boat it would really be on and how mm -hmm. much it would be when it landed loaded in this country and what the timing would be. And she said, this is absurd. And so she built an entire SaaS program around this and um, has gotten some really great traction, not only on the shipping side, but obviously on the customer side, mm -hmm. um, some large companies. So I like that because she was filling a void in her frustration in a business she already had built. Mm -hmm. um, your husband's also a, a high-profile investor. Do you have? He's to... much more high-profile than me. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But do you do you work well together on investments, or do you have to keep those types of things uh, separate? I mean, you know, listen. He's part of a partnership. Um, he has LPs. Um, he invests in things that are different than I invest in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, certainly conversations are had around the dinner table <laughs> around what we're investing in or looking at or, you know, um, the ups and the downs. But, you know, what I invest in is what I invest in, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to quote here from uh, the founder 
of a startup called PlateJoy that you've uh, invested oh, Chris, in. The, Christina. Christina in the past. Um, it says, the definition of the phrase, no bullshit, is certainly one she knows about. Do you have to sometimes tell <laughs> entrepreneurs, absolutely, down straight and narrow, this is right and this is wrong? Are, are those types of people find those quite things quite hard to hear sometimes? Is that fair? You know, listen, I think the role of an investor is to be supportive of the people you invest in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it is your role to say, this is how your business should run and this is what you should be doing. I think it's, I've seen this in the past. This is the potholes they went into. Here's a way that I would go about it. So it's advice giving, but there are other times where you are giving them serious, solid feedback that they might not want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not easy to do, but it's always um, given tremendous respect and thank you for being so honest. Um, and then just, just finally, Joanne, because I know we're coming towards the end of our time. Part of your transition from working for large corporations to being an angel investor as you are came out through, through your blog, is that right? Something yeah. that you're still continuing? Mm -hmm. So tell us a bit about the blog. It's, it's called... Gotham Gal. I mean, I've been doing it every... Well, not every day at the beginning. I don't think anybody was doing it every no. day at the beginning. Now you kind of have to. Um, so I've been doing it for 14 years, I guess, 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's funny. At one point, I actually went back and read some earlier stuff. The reality is I'm writing about the same stuff I read about 14 years ago. Yeah. Um, I'm just probably a better writer. Um, and, um, and it's really what's top of mind. So um, it's great. And, and off the back of that, that's how people started pitching ideas to yeah. you. And, and you welcome that, right? People just send them through to you and, and you read and consider all pitches. Yeah, I started really becoming, honestly, a chick magnet. I mean, yeah. people, particularly women, were like reaching out to me. I was resonating with them and I was meeting with them. And I sort of then made this conscious decision that... Mm -hmm. I should really be supporting these women. Great stuff. Well, Joanne, it's been uh, a pleasure speaking to you. The, you too. The blog is a great read. I recommend that to, to everyone. And uh, Joanne welcomes pitches. So uh, for those entrepreneurs looking mm -hmm. for investment, she's the first uh, port of call. Joanne, thank All you very much. Right. Thank you.